My name is Emmanuel Pascal and I'm the author And this is going to be a brief talk about the asynchronous data plane work that uh, we've been doing for FRR. I'm not the person who actually wrote the code and not the person who made the slides because the speaker was Mark Stapp, who's a colleague of mine. Unfortunately, he wouldn't fly to Prague, so he's stuck with me. Which means that if I say something that sounds kind of wrong, it's probably my fault. Something wrong in the slides or in the code, then you're fine. In case you, I mean, I guess you know what the query is, but very briefly, yeah, it's a writing suit for uh, Linux. It has various payments, which are various protocols, a lot of them GPT, GPT, SPSD, RSDS, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there's the Zebra, which is kind of special, and it's the uh, point of contact between all these demons, and basically uh, also the group in the current operating system. And one thing uh, I mean that um, David and Donald mentioned before is that this is code that comes from way back uh, FRR, I think starting in 2017, as a fork of Quagga, which started in 2005 or so as a continuation of Boot Zebra, which started in 1996. So you get the idea that coding is the coding, is <coughs> it works, it's stable, it's been around for a while, but you know, you don't get kind of fancy, no, sorry, fancy code that you would expect in 2019. And so it's mostly a single thread with a single event loop. Uh, other structures uh, are not very well isolated, so there's loads of bits of codes that touch those structures from different parts. And so it's not always easy to make things a bit more modular. Um, so the work that uh, and here is also the Zebra. And um, what are Zebra's responsibilities? It's the Web Manager. So, demons implement their own protocol logic and then they decide which route should be advertised and then they send them to Zebra. And Zebra keeps one route their destination and their F and their demon or demon instance because in some cases you can have one demon instance of each demon. And then it does some sort of normalization, it compares the metrics and the admin distance and all that and it selects. Which is the route that needs to be pushed to the So that the feed uh, process is also a responsibility of Zebra. Then you get stuff like desktop tracking. So if you have a requested desktop that has to be resolved through uh, uh, an address or interface, then that's not with Zebra. Uh, and if you route reduce the distribution, uh, you can notify owners of routes of the changes and um, those routes, those desktops, and you also listen to Netlink, uh, Kaggle events, for instance, Netlink in general, uh, in state changes or addresses assigned to different places, and stuff like And the internal communication uh, are between demons and zebra, happened to this Zappi thing that I mentioned before, and essentially each demon uh, sets up its own um, Zappi session in zebra, and it's very six routes, and can push it back and uh, interaction with the grid is mostly not through networking when it's available over IOCT. So this, <coughs> this, this is how Zebra looked like about uh, before 2018, I guess. Uh, everything was single thread. So all these things that, that we were saying before, uh, various demons talking to Zebra through the next sessions, there was a single thread that was Coding those messages and then figuring out what to do with them. There was a single, the same single thread was also intercepting the CLI commands for configuration, it was also receiving notification from the kernel, and it was also doing the actual reprocessing. So selecting the best route and then trying to push that to the feed to that. That's not effective. Um, so this is a graph actually, a film graph uh, created by Donald here, um, and it shows pretty clearly where it's probably spending this time. Uh, on the leftmost side, you see the um, uh, actual reprocessing part. On the rightmost side, you see a Zappi call about the route path. So some demon told Zebra the new route that it was trying to add to the so internal state. Then slightly more to the left, you have the B2S shell part of the CLI configuration. But the book is part in the middle. That's Netflix. Uh, that's the the big to feed part. So basically trying to write out something. So the, the, the data 
playing the board that I that might be that I'm presenting uh, had a couple of goals. One of them was to move that to a different feature so that Zgraph would be actually doing some other stuff uh, instead of you know, waiting for that link to give a response. Um, but before I get into that, um, there was a parallel work being done with the Zabi communication. So Zabi communication was also handled by a single thread. There was uh, parallel work with a lot of people. I think it was I think it's not sure. But, uh, basically, to, to do the same kind of thing, to move Zabi communication out. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is that there were some lessons learned that were uh, reproduced in the Zabi so the idea was you have a uh, per daemon thread. So one, one thread per daemon just listening to the Zabi uh, messages. And then you will do the encoding and the decoding. But because you really don't want to, you don't want to touch the actual uh, data structures inside Zebra uh, that are kind of all over the place, because that would have required a way bigger investment in terms of you know, rethinking the code and Sure that everything was stable. So they defined the boundary at the communication and the coding part. And so what this thread do is just kind of you know, seeing these messages, decoding them, putting them into a queue, and then the main zero thread can pull objects from its queue in its own time and just you know, update me as required. And the same thing in the other direction. So this is nice for a number of reasons. I mean, like, it doesn't really reduce the amount of work, but it makes it more modular. It defines a clear boundary between the various threads that you interact. It doesn't require uh, disruption to the core uh, single thread assumptions of the, of the code, or the existing code. But it also provides you with um, in a way to provide some rudimental, like, <coughs> some simple uh, fairness, because now you have queues, uh, and so you can maybe the rate at which the uh, main zebra thread reads up from this queue, uh, and so if you have a PGP feed that's pushing uh, 700,000 routes, you don't start other demons or you don't start some other functionality inside the zebra thread. Although this is uh, you know, kind of limited because demons were never designed to have the kind of flow control in the first place, so you can't have PGP to slow down. You have to absorb these inputs, and then you have to sort them into this queue. But what you can do with that is you know, kind of be fair in the way that Zebra single thread with these different views. So back to the data plane part, this is um, so what the goal was to actually do the same kind of thing for the netlink field programming, uh, to allow a thread, a different feed thread, to do that part, to do that part of the work. And so we use a similar approach to have uh, a queue between Zebra and Zebra main thread and Zebra data plane feed thread and passing objects between them so that you will have to change the assumptions about the single threadness of the link processing. Uh, the other goal was to support um, some sort of data plane that is not necessarily linear. So you might be working with the uh, physical boxes, and in our particular case, physical boxes are not always uh, co located with uh, Zebra. So, in the old world, everything is kind of synchronous. You install something, you wait for the result, and then you're done. If you work with a box that's somewhere, somewhere else, then you need to make that uh, asynchronous assumption explicit. You want an API that says, try to do that, and then you want to do some other stuff. And then sometimes later, you get a response saying that was OK, or you get a response saying that didn't work, and then you can use that result to update your Um, so the design approach that um, Mark took was um, to have these uh, provider concepts. So a provider is just uh, uh, an, an abstract representation of somebody who takes care of a, of a, of a data plane. So it could be, you would have the kernel provider, which is what actually is in charge of pushing stuff through NetLink to, to the kernel. But you can also have uh, a custom provider your own physical box that you will have to develop yourself, but that will interact with the API introduced by these patch of exchanges um, to register you know, this flow. And 
this is kind of what it looks like. So you have zebra matrix, and for some reason you get some notification from a daemon or, or does some next up tracking and decides that something has to be changed in zebra that way. So you take kind of a screenshot of uh, a snapshot sorry, of what's uh, what's the internal state of the object you need to change. Um, through the API that uh, had been added to Zebra, and then this object, which I call the context object, other way context object, is queued into a, a queue that goes into the Zebra data feature. Then the Zebra data feature takes that object and passes it to the internal provider, or to any other data provider that's registered, and the providers do their own work. And then eventually you get a result back in Zebra, and you can then update the feed or by the route owner and stuff like that. By the way, if there is any question, please interrupt me. I'm not the best one. So this is kind of just the same thing in a bit more detail. The kind of operations that at the moment uh, are supported are route updates, uh, f inventories, updates, uh, pseudo wire states, and IP. Interface analysis. Although this, I think, it's not being merged yet, but there's a request that's being reviewed. And uh, for each of these, you have APIs to populate that context object and then pass it on to the other provider, and then eventually it's the problem. So it's a bit do whatever it's to do, it will be distributed route, or the try owners, or that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and there's this kind of uh, basic queue management, so you can limit the depth of the queue towards the data plane and also the, queue, the depth of the queue at each point or provider. Um, so you make sure that you don't essentially start. So, um, the, other, the other thing is, if you have a physical box that you want to program through this, and you want the kernel to be in sync what that box sees. Um, I think my, my, my idea to solve the problem was to allow you to place your provider in an order in a daisy chain kind of pattern. So the objects will be passed to the startup link which and another link which will have a list of providers uh, and then it will kind of pass the object to the first one, the first two again to a set of cubes. And so these first provider might you know, try to run with the physical switch, and if everything was fine, send the update to the kernel, which would do the same thing in the back. But alternatively, you could decide maybe because installation failed to skip the kernel and just return the failure to Zebra, so that Zebra would be notified of that failure. And, and also, you can know, say that after the kernel, if you need information, it's only going to be provided by the kernel when it updates its, its, its um, context structure. So there's, this is kind of you know, the, the state of the work right now, but there's still a lot of uh, work to be done. So for example, the, this is a path through which you can push stuff <coughs> through, but you still have uh, notifications incoming from the kernel to, directly to the main zebra thread. So there's a discussion of whether that should also be moved to this Feature so that everything is fine there. Uh, and more in general, I think there is a bit of a discussion uh, with regard to what can you do as a data plane provider, what are you allowed to, what kind of APIs should be exposed to you. Because at the end of the day, you are working with um, hardware which has limited resources, and you might want to have some more degrees of freedom to uh, remove. If you're running out of resources, you might want to remove some PGP routes, to install some connected routes that they're pushing to you, if you cannot fit both, I don't know, just as an example. So there is a little bit more work to be done in terms of defining the APIs that as a provider you get to consume. And then there's performance improvements, of course, so uh, metric batching, uh, which was mentioned before, the share next to group thing, using the memory for of these context structs that you have to create every time you're passing data. 
What's the uh, channel between the uh, data plane and the main thread? What is that? What's the channel that you queues? How do you build them? They're, they're all they're the same, so they're just passing objects to the queue. I think there is privacy. Which queue? Between the two threads. But you said that you might have a remote data plane? Yeah, yeah, but the remote data plane would be, uh, so the, the data plane, the sample data plane API gives you a way to register a plugin as part of that chain here. So basically, it allows you to, it allows you to register here some code that will receive updates from the Zebra thread and then pass it on to all the providers like the journal one, which is like always the But the code here should be written by whoever provides them, whoever wants to run them. So you would have to write code that sends data to a box, and then consumes some sort of response, and then updates the context structures. That's not part of the So in this ex uh, this example, let's say I have Broadcom <coughs> kind of hardware and ASIC. Will that be called kernel provider or remote provider? Uh, that would be a remote provider. Okay. Uh, I think it depends, right? But yeah, it depends. You can do, so, so I think the difference between remote provider and kernel provider is that remote provider is the kernel provider. Right? Yeah. And It's a stream of data that can be read by someone remotely to do what as they please. And so that's what you mean by the And it's, if you go look into it, it's a zebra at the end, and I think you use part of the and you know, stream data about the route to the user. And so, so to, to specifically answer your question, is the ASIC doesn't care how it's programmed. It's up to the person doing the work how I want to program. Like, take the people's Linux example. We use the kernel as a source because we don't actually have one with the at all. It's all in the kernel, and someone else takes those kernel routes and programs the ASIC. So you need to write some How you program that ASIC is up to the company, but we currently want to be able to allow end users to have a remote provider. And then they write their own special code. We can't provide that because those are, you know, brought from Ezra as we can't get money for. Or if you want to do Mellanox, you have to their yeah, but they could provide those plugins that will fit, fit in here, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's just the plugin. Yes. But right now, that's not the current state of it. Like, uh, so Volta, as an example, is a remote provider, and they have special code that they, they take and they program basically. They, they don't have that. Yeah. So, so I. I only know the very old Quagga, and what I understand it, it, it had Zebra D, but, and talked to the kernel with uh, Netlink, and I assume kernel provider is the Netlink speaker, and the remote provider is the ASIC or anything, and uh, so, so basically, Zebra data plane in this diagram is the Zebra D itself. It's the, the data plane feature within Zebra. Uh -huh. It's basically it was, uh, two threads. This, this, the whole thing is Zebra, right? But mm -hmm. the left side is the single thread kind of thing that's mm -hmm. Zebra right now, and the right part is a separate thread that's just in charge of the mapping part or the remote uh, data plane. Oh, I see. Thank you. Are there actually any <coughs> routing protocol clients that take the um, successful installation of the routes into account, kind of that feedback path? That's a very good question. So, as far as I understand, maybe only GP, I'm not sure. No. Yeah, I, I can. So, so th that is a long standing open issue that we need to fix. Um, currently, there's no provision for even communicating that to the demons. The, what? No, yeah, I put it in. So, so currently, if you can, as a upper level protocol, you can register with Zebra saying, hey, when my route installs or fails or whatever happens to it, let me know what the, 
the status of it. So that feedback mechanism there, only like one daemon actually watches that currently because, you know, again, someone has to go through and do it, but you're actually 100% right. The feedback mechanism for like, things like RIP and BGP, they need to be there, just haven't been done yet. So that's in the process. But uh, the, the infrastructure is there. Someone needs to go and write it and take advantage of it. And we actually have a pull request for BGP to take advantage of that, but they were running into some other issues and we haven't quite gotten it in the code base yet. So there's a, a, a demon called, uh, I shouldn't have named it this, I called it Sharp D. It was a joke. And uh, I thought the people were going to go, Donald, great idea, stupid demon name. But it went in. So um, it basically, it's a, a proof of concept. I can, you can say, install a million routes. And it will install a million routes for you. And it knows when those million routes are installed. It's a testing demon, but it's great for a proof of concept. So like if you have, you know, you're, you're going to a customer and they say, can, you're, can, you, can you handle a million routes? Well, sure, here. One line, I have a million routes in the rib, and then they're installed. So that's kind of the goal. And so it knows, and I also use it as a development feature for myself. So I do a lot of performance testing. So I have a regular way to install and remove routes that I can then look at the timing. And so the, the daemon pays attention to that and knows, oh, you told me to install a million routes. I got a million notifications back that they're installed. I'm done, and it's in, it's in, the, it's in the kernel. So I know for a fact how long it took. So, so it, it's an, isn't that really kind of a individual NOS? Everyone, every NOS behaves a little differently. So I can answer from a Cumulus Linux perspective. I can't necessarily answer from a Volta perspective about how that works. Um, so in typical, the <clears throat> typically we do not notify, Zebra does not notify the upper level protocol that the route was installed successfully until I got the end of the, if you, can you go back to the, uh, the next slide, I guess? This slide, so that, this slide, so it's, when the result comes back here, that is when the notification, so, th so that's when it happens. So, so if, 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 like take Volta as an example here, if the remote provider says it's installed and gets, we get the context back, then we know it's installed. Okay, so, but I don't know, I haven't looked at Volta's implementation to know for a fact. So there is no feedback current mechanism between, for Cumulus Linux, unfortunately, there's no current feedback to, when the route goes into the kernel, it, there is a small delay before it goes into the ASIC, but that, we don't have that programmed at this point in time. It's something we know and it's gonna be worked on. Um. Uh, do you have more presentation or? Okay, um, then, so just for clarification, there are three different ways that uh, FRR can talk to some switch silicon. Um, number, number one is just through a kernel driver that hooks into the appropriate switch dev APIs. I think Mellanox Spectrum driver does this upstream. Um, number two is you can have a user space daemon separate of FRR that just reads Netlink. That's what Cumulus does with uh, SwitchD. And number three is the work that is done here, um, where you create a custom plugin that runs inside of Zebra in the process and does whatever you want to talk to your data plane. That could be zero MQ, that could be direct hardware, whatever. Um, and um, yeah, that, that is the focus here. And um, I, I actually have, I have two questions on this. Um, the one is for the kernel people um, regarding multi-threading this. Um, so should we as user space um, also try to multi-thread our uh, routing table updates because there's still the RTNL lock, lock so I guess. The, the answer is no, and he actually kind of alluded to it. It's the batch, the, the answer from the kernel perspective. So you're right, there is a lock, a global lock for each route install, so you can't multi-thread it. So what the, 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 the kernel answer is that you can pass down a bunch of route or Netlink messages at one time and you save the 50 million, like so if you, if you batch 100 route installs, instead of, instead of um, you know, one, one write, then a read by the kernel, then a, then a write for the answer back, you get one write down for everything and the kernel lock, opens the lock once, does all the work, 
unlocks the lock and passes it up. So you get a lot less lock in and you get a lot less contention. And you actually get some speed ups. It's about, you know, we have, like, it's the patch request isn't presented upstream, but it's about a quarter faster. Any, does anyone want to add? I don't want to add to that, but to clarify further, the option number three that you gave you can use, you can program your hardware directly from the Zebra. That would be most efficient? Um, well, I, I mean, if you want to do that, so. so the control and you kind of bypass the sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't bypass the kernel at that point. You're inside of the Zebra process. So. You can so do your own forwarding driver as well as the Zebra API that gives you. Yeah. So, and the other. This actually leads straight over to the other thing I wanted to bring up, which is kind of a question suggestion combination. I was hoping to discuss this with Mark. Um, right now, the data plane API, um, it does support multiple data plane handlers, I think. Or at least that's planned. Um, but it's not organized in a way that allows it to, um, to abstract away. So I'm actually going to paint on the white part, white part here. So um, right now, what we, what we have is the, the rib and zebra. And it uses the data plane abstraction, which does cover both uh, plugin and netlink. Uh, but that, that's about it for the structure. So there's, it's a fixed structure where you can have one or more data plane handlers that does the updating. And I, I guess that the kernel and the remote API are actually not going to be treated any different on this. However, uh, we can actually improve on this design um, if we have um, a well-defined, um, well, abstracted point of interfacing here that allows reusing itself at a later point. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is exactly what you asked about the source of truth. Um, right now, we have hard-coded into the data plane handling for whenever multiple data planes are in there that something needs to happen when the results disagree. So um, if we make this API reusable, uh, we can have the Zebra rib only interface with one uh, data plane handler. And the data plane handler itself can be a module that is, for example, a combination service. And you can put the policy into that combination data plane. And you can implement whatever you're interested in for your particular application case. And you can also put things in here like route table compression. So um, if you want to, do people here know what route table compression is? So you, you just, um, uh, since the routes are generally similar, you try to install fewer routes by reusing the same route and yeah. So um, that could be simply an inline proxy that goes from the rib and compresses. And then uses the same API again um, to talk to the kernel or to this splitter functionality or something like that. Um, or even putting this further, you can also support multi-chassis devices through this, where you have a handler in the middle, in the middle that takes care of properly programming your two, three, four, twenty different devices with possibly modified next stops that make sure that the devices talk to each other and you need different next stops and so on. Um, but I don't think this is so, something you can currently do and I was just hoping to bring this up here and um, get the discussion rolling on, on how we get here from the current data plane that we have. Yeah, just wondering um, on the uh, shared next hub groups, is there also, you know, some kind of tracking in terms of when you've got reconvergence typically, you know, you've got 10,000 routes that all, you know, f f for all of whom the uh, next hop group, you know, just the next hops are changing. So basically, could keep the next hop group to change the actual members of it. Is 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 that something that you know the uh, uh, zebra demon is trying to do then? So so like so the, this, yes, but it's not there. So the, the current goal is to get next hop groups in, and then and then add the extensibility to allow to the so from a Linux kernel perspective, it's already. Right, but what I'm saying is that, yeah. Right, 
Right, but what I'm what I'm saying is that um, you know you want to update the next top group members themselves. Okay, so 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 that API call itself isn't even there yet. Be I mean, okay. <laughs>